Hey there everyone, it's 5.37 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, August 25th, and it's most likely 2,021 years from something. Uh, it's just from what, I guess, is the question. I'm going to be continuing in Luke, I guess chapter 12. I did have to go back and establish a few things from 10 and 11 just to see how their, the continuity was going or not going uh, between specifically Luke and Matthew. And remember, I don't bring Mark or John into this too much because I don't want it to be so long that this has to be 20 plus parts, which if I brought Mark and John, it would probably be more than that. It would probably just be an ongoing thing. There's, there's just, there's that much, um, just to the differences between Luke and Matthew. <clears throat> and the more I go through this, the more surprised I become, or chagrined I get, at just the idea that, that Luke, Matthew, and Mark are called these synoptic gospels. What they mean by that is that they're all following the same, the same form. And you get a lot of stories from that, um, why they seem to all be following the, the same form. But what we'll see is they're not. It's just not fair at all. And what it appears to be is going on more than anything, I think, is that you had at least this gospel more likely written by Matthew. And somebody probably um, condensed it or, you know, chopped off a lot of it, stripped away a lot of it, and produced what we know of as Mark. And then Luke is a different story because Luke's not necessarily, though it is a bit shorter than Matthew, um, not in the same way that Mark is. Mark, as I said, almost just seems to be streamlined, like it's it's like a streamlined version of Matthew, but not Luke. The thing is, Luke could have been like that. Um, it's not. It oftentimes, of, of course, doesn't follow the same order of events, for one thing. And for another thing is, there's a lot of portions of Luke that you can't find anywhere else. And as I've said in the past, yet you have to consider that um, the Bible as we know it is a book that uh, some bodies decided should all be compiled together and they put their stamp of approval on and for some reason very few people think whether that was a good idea or not these days. Because they don't examine all of the books to see if they harmonize. Well, since I haven't been struck down by lightning yet, I'm going to continue to do this to see if these books harmonize and what books seem like they actually belong harmoniously with the rest and what don't seem like they should. The first thing I want to bring up Although I didn't get too far into, you know, geography and locations, because if I did, uh, that in and of itself could be its its own study. And uh, there certainly will be at least a chapter concerning geography as per according to the New Testament authors in the upcoming book. I'm, I'm also going to be releasing a uh, TOH, the Obrey Hours, here pretty soon, where I'm going to be going through all of the passages concerning the sun, the movement of the sun, and whether the the verbs and the the key words that are are used with it to describe what it's doing are have in fact been translated correctly or not, and whether or not the words that are typically used for evening and morning have been translated correctly or not. It is a big can of worms, and it's really what's been hanging me up 
on continuing with my book on geography for quite some time. So don't miss that uh, when it comes out. Listen to it. It's, yeah, it's going to be deep. It's going to be complicated, like a lot of the Obrey Hours are, but really important stuff. Very, very important stuff. And, you know, for anyone that, that really grasps what I'm saying about the, the issues with it and the importance of the sun and the movements of the sun as, as they dictate direction and things like that, uh, give me some feedback because it, it is right now the, the number one problem with continuing forward with the book on geography because if we don't got where the sun is coming up and going down correct, we've got a problem with just about everything. We're talking about the difference between east and west. So, all right. Uh, what I did was I backtracked a little bit. We ended up in Luke 11 last time. And I, I did backtrack to, uh, to Luke 10.38 just to figure out where he's at at this point in time because that's important. If one author says he's one place and another author says he's at another, we have an issue. In Matthew or in Luke 10.38, it says he goes to a certain village, to the house of Mary Martha. And we know from John that their brother is Lazarus. Now, this is, this is according to Luke and John. This is not according to Matthew or Mark. They make no mention of this family and these siblings. Okay, just Luke and John. Um... So what we know is that that would put him as going towards, and we do have other passages, as going towards Jerusalem. What's important about that is that we saw last time a lot of passages in Luke 11 that parallel the account of Matthew from Matthew 19 forward. Uh, Matthew 19 is what's called the triumphal entry, where he goes into Jerusalem for the last time. And so, if we see a lot of verses or a lot of passages in Luke 11 and Luke 12, we know that he's in Jerusalem. And a lot of these passages are paralleling passages we can see from Matthew chapter 19 and forward. And that would be fine, uh, except for the fact that in, in Luke, he's not, he doesn't stay in Jerusalem, he leaves Jerusalem. Um, and then comes back again, and it's from that point forward that what he's doing and what he's saying should be paralleling Matthew 19 forward, and that's, that's a problem. Um, so let, we'll just start in at, at Luke 12, and I'm actually going to hit, uh, verses 12. The passage is... Luke 12, 8 through 12, but I'm just going to do verses 8 and 9, and I'd like to contrast them with what are supposed to be the parallel verses in a passage from Matthew. Of course, now we're not in late Matthew, we're, we're going back to early Matthew, because of course none of this follows chronologically. All right, so Luke 12, 8 and 9, um, Jesus speaking, also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And I will read the parallel here in Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 10 and 32 and 33. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. I'm sure the first thing that, that stuck out was the fact that in Luke, he's saying that he's going to confess them before the angels the angels of heaven. It, it's interesting because um, one of the things, of course, we saw last time in Luke was when they said that the 72, which Luke seems to pull out of nowhere because we can't find 
this sending out of these 72 anywhere else. In Matthew, he sends out his 12. And when they come back, in that last chapter we went over, and they said, oh, it's just fantastic. Even the devils are uh, subservient to us. And it's like his first, his first comment to them is, I saw Satan fall this lightning from heaven. That's only in Luke. It's absolutely only, only, only in Luke. <sighs> these ideas that we have, these, these pictures that we have formed of the devil falling from heaven like lightning and all that, that's absolutely only Luke. Only Luke. Only Luke. Now, yeah, are, is there, and this is interesting, yeah, is there some symbolic language? You specifically in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 12, about Satan, his angels being cast out of heaven. Yeah. And Revelation is a book of symbolism. It is a book so heavily loaded with symbolism that for anybody to contrive doctrine from that is uh, it's misguided and probably pretty irresponsible. So we should note that Luke has got you show Jesus saying, I will confess you or not confess you before the angels. Okay? And in Matthew, he says, before my father. Because it's ultimately, if his father is Yahweh, that's who matters concerning his confession. Right? I would think. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm going to seemingly depart for a second here, but it's important. Now, this isn't something that I've necessarily seen as a difference between Luke and Matthew, but I do want to, I, I want to pay attention to it for a minute. One thing I noticed that was interesting, there was a difference, by the way, in, uh, in those verses of Luke and the verses of Matthew and the verses of Luke. Uh, he appears to speak of himself in third person. We'll see this in other Gospels, so this isn't like a, thing peculiar just to Luke, son of man, okay? That, that is him appearing to speak of himself in third person. Now in Matthew, he says just, I, your typical ego a me, okay? Now that may not be a big deal, even though it's, um, you know, you, you'd probably, I guess you would be nitpicking if you said, well, you know, in that one, he speaks of himself in third person, and that one... He, he uses the first person, and, and well, that it is a difference, but that's not what I want to talk about. It, but it is a difference. It's just this uh, phrase that we see in the Gospels, different Gospels. The Son of Man. And him speaking of himself in third person like that. Here's what I find really fascinating about this now. Um, when we look at the the events of his life i even think when we look at the events of his death and his burial and his resurrection i see symbolism now when i say i see symbolism i'm not saying it like the symbolism in revelation as in revelation <laughs> is a book of prophecy or is a book of ciphering of prophecy and it uses symbolic language um, and metaphors <clears throat> they call it oftentimes apocryphal language excuse me not the same thing what I mean is literally his his life the events of his life in a sense are I see oftentimes a parallel with a difference and the parallel is um the race of adam and but particularly israel and not only their past um, but their future and maybe the present because i i haven't yet done a study it, it would certainly be worth a study to do the parallels between his his birth his life his ministry and his death and resurrection and the the same concerning Israel. You know, the big difference is that he did everything correctly. 
he kept the law, and he died unjustly. Um, Israel was to suffer quite justly. Um, but we also see a resurrection, too, which is interesting because throughout all the prophets in the Old Testament, we see the same sort of um, foreshadowing of, of a darkness that Israel would endure, the, the Yom Yahweh, the, the day of the Lord. And we see these promises of a new Israel, uh, not the church as opposed to genetic Israel. We're talking about the sons of Jacob Israel being made anew resurrected, if you will, from Jeremiah 30, 31 through 34. Um, in a sense, the micro, you know, the microcosm the, and the macrocosm between the, the life of Israel before this point and what it would be after this point. And what we see in the, the birth, life, uh, death, resurrection, of you show Jesus. Uh, I, I see a lot of parallels in there. Oh, lots and lots. So what's interesting is the fact that now if he's referring to himself in the third person, um, if this was originally written in Obrian, I think it was, we would see it as Bani Adam. That would be the term he would be using, Bani Adam. Funny thing about Obri is when you look at it grammatically, there are words and there are ways words can be phrased, which can be used different ways, just depending. So could he be referring to himself in the third person to call himself Benny Adam, like as a, almost like a, as a representation or saying like the son of Adam, certainly. Certainly. But there were prophets in the Old Testament that were also called Benny Adam. There were visions of prophets when they said that they would see someone who looked like Benny Adam. What were they doing? They were specifying a man who was of a certain kind, Benny Adam. Now, depending on, on how these passages were originally written, and I haven't seen the Obrey copies of them, you know, I have Shem Tob's Hebrew, Matthew. The interesting thing about it is, depending on how the grammar goes in a lot of the verses where he uses the term son of man, remember, what it would probably be in Obrey is just Benny Adam. Now, what would be interesting is going through there and deciding which verses of those are, are is he talking about himself in third person and which verses of those is he talking about Benny Adam as in a race, a particular kind. Just something to bring up. It's food for thought. It, you know, it's the same thing with Christos, okay? Whenever you see Christos uh, in the New Testament, if you're a big fan of Paul, that's fine include his writings and just consider that word you know Christos the thing is that it's parallel to what we'll see in the Old Testament um, as an anointed well when you look at the the Old Testament and you look at the parallel words there's more than one word used for anointed it's not just Mashiach um, it's it's speaking of Israel the nation. Um, and then there again you have what seems to be these micro and macro parallels. More food for thought, I hope. So I'll move forward, all right, from Luke 12, 8 and 9 to the parable of the rich fool. This is Luke 12 from 13 to 21. Now this again, this isn't found anywhere else. It's not found in Matthew, it's not found in Mark or John. I'm, I'm just going to look at my notes real quick. So, there, yeah, there seem to be bits and pieces, like little verses here and there that might have been taken 
Oh, no, that's the next one. Sorry. What I remember about this, I'll just read my notes that, um, see if I've got anything. Not really. All right. So I did notice when I read through this the first couple of times that it, it seemed like it was slightly paralleling a few other things that, that happened in, in other gospel accounts. But the bulk of it, not really. And here's what I didn't really get about it. So it says that one, it's starting in Luke 12, 13, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. First off, it says one of, one of his company. Now that doesn't necessarily mean one of his 12, but definitely the people who were with him or might have been traveling with him. This is not a scribe or a Pharisee or maybe a random guy on the street or a stranger. It wouldn't seem. Just to stick that in there. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, so now he's speaking to everyone, Take heed and beware of the covetous, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room whereas to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, that thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God has said unto him, You fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So this passage, I don't have to deal with anybody else because it's only in Luke. And I would like to say just a couple of things about it. A couple of things you can take or leave them as you will. The one thing I thought was kind of interesting is when he says to him, Who made me a judge or a divider over you? Now in some translations, they actually use the word arbiter, and, and that would be appropriate, actually. Um, they say the Greek word here is maristas, and a portion or, a, or administrator, a divider. And a divider and a judge is an arbiter. If you get arbitration, that's literally somebody who just considers a matter and then they, they judge. Okay, That's really interesting because... Um, I don't know. He, look, if he's supposed to be like, for instance, the third person of a, a Trinitarian Godhead, well, then he would be a judge. He would be a divider, a, an arbiter. Um, in a sense, him saying that, I think, reveals the fact that he was man. Um, I'm not saying that he wasn't the, as they like to say, the monogenes, you know, the only man born from Yahweh, conceived from Yahweh to a woman, okay? But I find that a bit interesting. The other thing I find kind of interesting is this. So in the parable that he's talking about, and I guess the object lesson that he's trying to impress upon them, as according to Luke, I'm not even saying this happened, but I'm saying as according to Luke, um... First off, I don't know how it is that this man is is assumed covetous. If he had a rightful claim, somebody denied him. Now, we know that the judges of Israel, or of Judah, that's all that was left. Israel was gone, most of Israel. They were pretty corrupt. So he may have gotten a bad deal. And he may have wanted because... By this time, Yusho had quite a reputation all over the place. And he might have been wanting him to settle that for him, um, which was not what he was here to do. Okay. Um, but the weird thing is how 
it almost seems to be a criticism of somebody amassing a, a great deal of things. When we read throughout, we read, we read throughout the Old Testament that actually Yahweh blesses a lot of people with many earthly things that like those aren't a bad thing in and of themselves they are not a bad thing um we see throughout like wisdom literature of the old testament the prophets and the law that the last thing we should do is put our faith in things that's true um I don't know if this guy necessarily put his faith in things. He had a lot. It said the, the, the land, the land, was it the land or was it the Adame? You, you would have had to have listened to episode 10 of the Obrey Hours to understand why that would be important. Brought forth uh, an abundance to him. And because of that, he actually had to build more. He said he'll tear down the barns that he had and, and he would build more, bigger to store everything, and that there was somehow something wrong with that. Um, you know, I'm looking at the text again to see, well, was he putting his faith in those things, or did he just have a lot? And it doesn't say he was stingy, per se, either. So, to be honest with you, I don't get what this guy was doing who had been blessed so much that was wrong. You can sort that out for yourself. I'll move forward, okay? Now, immediately following this in Luke 22 through 34, they subtitle it, Don't Be Anxious. <clears throat> right. Okay, what's, um, that's kind of, it's weird. Because it's out of context, and if you read this whole chapter, it doesn't seem to be following this um, the same kind of good continuity of thought as if you took these same verses and you put them into Matthew and read them in context there. In fact, a lot of the verses from 1222 through 34 are found paralleled specifically in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Luke 12. He had just jumped to Matthew 10. In the chapter before this, he was jumping forward to the last five or six chapters of Matthew. And now all of this is hearkening back to the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, we have verses that are, that are direct, exact parallel verses to, to Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. <clears throat> now here's the real problem with it. So, I guess the story that most of us would get about Luke, they would say, well, all right, so Luke was, <laughs> he wasn't Jewish. Yeah, well, who knows, right? Anyways, so let's say he wasn't an Israelite. Let's work on that assumption. Luke wasn't an Israelite. He was a Greek. This is, this is the mainstream story about Luke, and we know we can trust all the mainstream stories about everything out there right? And that what he did was he had met up with Paul, and that he had looked into all of this because he had been told about all of this from Paul, and that he had gone back because he was a very astute historian, and he had gathered all of these facts and put them together and produced his own gospel. That's the mainstream story. Now, if a, if a chronologist or a historian is trying to put together an accurate account of someone's life and their doings, there's some things that they're going to pay a lot of attention to. Um, they would be acutely interested in things like when someone said something, in what context they said that in, okay? Now, if, if somebody said that Jesus said to them that he's going to return, if I was the chronologist or historian, I, I might say, okay, well, when did he say that exactly? Did he say that before he went to a certain town or right before he was put to death? Because that would, that would really matter if somebody was going to build doctrine from that. We might want to know 
that, oh, he said that he was going to return before he went to Bethsaida. Oh, <laughs> did he return? Well, yeah, he did. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I'd want to write that down. And if somebody said, well, he said he would return right before he was put to death. Okay, now that's important. Did he know he was going to be put to death? He did. Okay, and I would write that. Down. Now, what was the context of this? And I would write that down. This would all be very important, especially if we're talking about somebody who is supposed to be the son of God. The monogenes would really want to pay a lot of attention to what he said, what the context was of, of what he said, when he said it, in what order did he say these things? Because, listen, doctrine, the doctrines of today's denominations of churches, like all of them, they're all based on the words and doings of this man. Doctrine, the way that people behave, the way people live their life, how uptight they are about somebody saying the F word around them, all kinds of things. They're all based on what this guy said and did. So you would think it was really important to get things like that to get the context right. If Luke was such an uh, astute historian and chronologer, as they try to tell us he was, you would think he would have been slightly more accurate than what we've seen so far. And unfortunately, we're only about halfway or so through. And we've seen so much out of context, so much with... Um, unharmonious chronology that it is it's just a, it's a crying shame okay so the next thing is Luke 12 39 real weird man Luke 12 39 <laughs> this is part of a section it's still like you must be ready right so before that, do not be anxious, and you must be ready. And all of these verses, and I'm not going to go through all of the verses from then till now, because if I did, I would be going everywhere. I would be going back in Matthew. I would be going forward in Matthew. Some of them would seem like they're following around the same time as Matthew, but they'd be so far out of whack. I don't have the time to point all of those things out. You you can look. It's real easy. You can use eSword in the TSK cross-reference and you can just click on each verse. Luke 12 35 you can click on that and you'll see references they'll have. They'll do sometimes references by topic, they'll do sometimes references by words and you can see where these things, these ideas, these concepts or exact verses are reflected in the other Gospels. So you'll see how out of whack they are. That's really weird. So in Luke 39 when he's He's in this, um, they're saying the subject matter is, you must be ready. And Luke 39, he says, in this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house be broken through. That is lifted directly from Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. That's actually, uh, that statement is part of a culmination of ideas being expressed specifically in the Olivet Discourse. But here we have them lifted a couple of verses right out of context in the Olivet Discourse and, and put in a, just an entirely different context here in Luke. And it, it doesn't get any better. Uh, the section starts out with the let your light shine from the Sermon on the Mount or on the plain, <laughs> depending on if it's Matthew or Luke. Uh, then sounds like the parable of the ten virgin, virgins from Matthew 25. All right. Then the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. Then verses 49 and 50 is like Nowheresville. We have no idea where that's coming from. That again was pulled out of somewhere that can't be found in any of the other Gospels. Then verse 51 and 53 is back to Matthew chapter 10 for parallel. 
Okay, and then 1254 through 56, he gives symbolism of clouds, then wind. And 54 is, is maybe sort of from Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, he's speaking to the Pharisees. In Luke 12, he's speaking to the people. The verse about interpreting the times, like the point earlier about getting context, it's different in either case. It's a completely different context between Luke and Matthew. Because in either case, the context and audience and time frame is different. So it's no wonder why people can make whatever doctrine or dogma they want to because of things like this. I mean, you can go into you can go in the Bible, you can get whatever you want out of it, especially the gospels. You get whatever doctrine you want. People that are upset about how many denominations there are out there, well they they should be upset about this. They should be upset with how different these things are and how non-harmonious these things are. If they don't like the fact that there's so many denominations out there, well, you know, they should be right behind me on this. Saying, yeah, why is this? These, these things don't line up. Context matters. Chronology matters. Location matters. If they say he's here and the other one says he's there, if this one says that he was in Jerusalem for the last time and this one says he's in Jerusalem, but it, they have him traveling elsewhere after this and then back to Jerusalem, that matters. Because just accepting all of these and then trying to go through them and, and form some kind of doctrine, first off, it's a huge mistake to form all of your doctrine off of one book of a Bible that is, is just huge. All the, all the material, the bulk of all the material is happening before any of this anyways. But we're forming most of our, our doctrines concerning how we behave and think and everything based on this really small section of the Bible. And most of it based um, on the opinions of a guy who didn't even know Jesus and, and had no proof of uh, the, the things he's saying happened, the, the road to Damascus and so on and so forth. Whether you, you love Paul or not, that's just... That's just the way it is. You're forming most of your doctrine and your beliefs and your behavior based on a minority of Scripture, and most of that is from the writings, the beliefs, the opinions of one guy who wasn't even an eyewitness to Jesus and changed his story two or three times concerning the Road to Damascus event. And there's other problems, of course, with him too. So... Back to Luke. Once we get to 12, 57 through 59 in Luke, um, this is the settle with your accuser. Now he's, he's gone from the, um, you know, be not anxious to uh, the not peace but division part. Now this is the, this is part of what I was pointing out. We're at different, different areas of Matthew. Okay. Then he goes into the interpreting of time and I went over that too. Then he just likes, takes a hard curve and goes to settle with your accuser. Literally just a 90 degree from the interpreting of the time to the settling with your accuser. And I'm not kidding. And that's, that's a crazy shift in logical thought or progression of thought. You would think if somebody was giving a dissertation, there would be a logical progression of thought. But he takes this 90 degree or maybe 180 degree or 270 degree, whatever you want to call it, certainly not straight and concise and consistent into this settle with your accuser, which is where is it found? It's found in the Sermon on the Mount. We got to go all the way back to Matthew chapter 6 to find a parallel to that. My goodness. Okay, so let's just go forward to Luke 13, because there's no point in dwelling on all of this uh, insanity that is Luke chapter 12. So Luke chapter 13 doesn't get any less interesting or bizarre in the sense that first off, Luke 13, 1 through 5 is an account not found anywhere else. Again, it's the, uh, <clears throat> in Luke, to refresh everyone's memory, it says there were present at that season, some that told him of the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean. And then 13.2, And Jesus answering said unto them, they told, ans they, there's not a question, but okay, he answering said to them, suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What is what is he saying there in the same way that those people perished? If they don't repent, they're going to... Does he mean through, like, violence? Or does he mean unless you repent, you will still perish? Because I don't know. Because it appears that a lot of people have repented that still perished. But does he mean violently? Does he mean your life would be cut short? I, I don't know. He continues, or he continues according to Luke, or those 18, 18, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. <laughs> what? Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. First off, isn't he saying uh, that these people, they told him about that Pilate, I guess, mixed their blood with their sacrifices. Okay. Uh, he says, do you think they were bigger sinners than the other Galileans? And then, no, but if you don't repent, you shall perish. And then the 18 upon which the tower fell... Do you think that they were sinners above all who dwelt in Jerusalem? And I tell you, no, they weren't. But if you don't repent, you shall perish like them. I've got, I'm just, I'm, I'm adjusting my thinking cap to try to get, I'm trying to follow the logic there. But either way, all right, for one thing, we do have, first off, this passage not found anywhere else. Uh, secondly, concerning Siloam, uh, the only other reference we have to Siloam is this pool, this pool of Siloam. We don't have a tower anywhere else falling on anybody. So I don't know if that happened or not. According to Luke, it did, but nobody else mentions it. And then this idea that these people weren't necessarily sinners, but if you don't repent, you'll perish like them. I'm still not, I'm sorry, I'm not getting it. Sorry. Now, the, we go on Luke 13, 6 through 9. Uh, it's a parable. And this parable, it's called the parable of the barren fig tree. Now, this is really interesting. And here's why. Because this seems to be actually a blend of two things. The first thing is an actual event where he curses a barren fig tree. In Jerusalem, in Matthew and Mark, when he goes to Jerusalem for the last time, he comes upon a fig tree with no fruit. And he curses the fig tree. And there is symbolism in him cursing of the fig tree. Luke does not have that. Luke has got this parable. The weird thing about this parable is he seems to blend an actual event from Matthew and Mark with a parable from Matthew. The, the parable is the parable of the vineyard. It is, um, let's see. Yeah, Matthew 21, 34 through 40. The cursing of the fig tree was actually Matthew 21, 19, and 20. So the actual event in Matthew of him cursing a fig tree was in Matthew 21, the last time he was in Jerusalem, 19 through 20. And then right after this, he actually tells, he, he tells a parable that, that actually, now in Matthew, actually after this, he tells a parable that has a lot to do with why he cursed that fig tree. That parallel is, is, is a teaching of why he did something that was symbolic. 
But Luke blends, <laughs> blends an actual thing that happened with a parable that he tells. He condenses the parable. He mixes in the cursing of the fig tree into this whole thing, and it, and it comes out this sort of abomination now. <laughs> I'm I'm not trying to get into numerology too much, but I do pay attention when there are numbers. I think that we shouldn't ignore it when there's numbers. We can't make everything out of everything, but you know, we can pay attention to things like there's 66 books in the accepted Bible. That might be important. Now here in Luke chapter 13, the number 18 appears in Luke chapter 13 three times three times um you know i don't know what significance it is that three times 18 is 54 which is six times nine but there's a lot of sixes in there okay 18 is six plus six plus six it appears in luke 4 luke 11 and luke 16 over the course of 12 verses we got sixes everywhere just an observation. I don't know that that necessarily means or adds up to anything really deep, but I don't want to ignore numbers. Um, I just don't. I'm not a guy who's going to convince you that I know a lot about numerology. I just know that there are a lot of numbers that are used by certain people repetitively. All right. Now, in Luke 13, 10 through 17, there's this account of a woman with a disabling spirit. Again, this is not found elsewhere. But it does mix dialogue concerning other events from Matthew, other Gospels, and other, and other portions of Luke uh, are all mixed into this event uh, of this girl with a uh, disabling spirit okay so yeah something else that's strange I'll bring back up geography in Luke chapter 10 we have him in Bethany he would have to be in Bethany if John is to be trusted who says that Mary Martha Lazarus's house was in Bethany and that was right by Jerusalem so we have him there we should have him in Jerusalem for some of these events from Luke 10 through 13, but then in Luke 13, 22, and it says, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Well, where was he before that? Because the location of the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus makes it seem pretty evident that it's right by Jerusalem and this is the last physical location we have him at and I'm going to give you a sense of how close this Bethany had to be to Jerusalem so you understand the oddity of what we're seeing here okay in uh, in the Gospel of John the account is according to John in John 12 9 through 11 it's the parallel to Luke 10 when he's in the house of Mary and Martha and the one serving him and the one at his feet. This is the parallel account. Now in John, this is right before he <laughs> goes into the triumphal entry. So again, we can see that it is very strange that in Luke, that's not the last time he's in Jerusalem. He leaves Jerusalem for quite some time in Luke and then returns for his last time in Jerusalem. So that's a serious problem. But we see that when he's in Bethany in this parallel event, that um, when he's at Bethany, it says that he raised Lazarus before this event, as according to John. And then it says, uh, just starting in John 12, 12, the next day, the next day, after he's at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house, the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed the king of Israel. Okay, So Bethany is right by Jerusalem. It's right by Jerusalem. Yet, in Luke, we know that he had to be right by Jerusalem. If he didn't go to Jerusalem right after he was at 
Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house in Luke chapter 10, we know he was near Jerusalem, and yet in here it says, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Highly unlikely that between Bethany and Jerusalem there would have been cities with an S and villages with an S. It doesn't wash. It just doesn't add up. And so here is a further problem because in Luke 13.31 is Luke's version of his lament over Jerusalem. Now it is presented differently and, of course, in a different time and context than Matthew. In Matthew, he is at Jerusalem for his final days, and this is Matthew 23, 37 through 39. In Luke, this is not the case. Um, also something that's very specific only to Luke, uh, and I'll go here and I'll tell you why this is important. Luke 13, 31 through 35. Okay, he had, well, we don't get a good idea where he's from because there's just been mostly a lot of dialogue the last few chapters of Luke, okay? But here, starting in verse 31 of chapter 13 of Luke, it says, The same day there came certain Pharisees, saying to him, Get out and depart, for Herod will kill you. So that means he probably was in Jerusalem. Now, we do have some problems when we look at certain Gospels and how they refer to Herod and where he was. But let's go forward. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Okay. And then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the the day following, which just says in the text, it just says, and following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So that would put him in Jerusalem here in Luke 13. So we have confirmation, all right, because we just saw before it said he was going through all these cities to Jerusalem, okay. So we know for a fact by Luke 13 that he's supposed to be in Jerusalem. And then here's where he gives his Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killed the prophets and stoned them that are sent unto thee. Um, yeah, and that's, it's out of context with Matthew. And here's why. Because if this were parallel with Matthew 23, it's found in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. He'd be in Jerusalem at the end, but he isn't. Because in Luke 17, 11, it has him passing through Galilee and Samaria going towards Jerusalem. So he's obviously left. See the problem? It's a great, big, huge problem. In Luke 19, 1, he's in Jericho. In Luke 19, 11, he's near Jerusalem. So the accounts of Luke that supposedly parallel Matthew 21 forward can't because he doesn't come to Jerusalem finally in Luke until chapter 19. So it is completely, completely out of order. Now something that's really... So I did want to point out that this this whole little passage here in Luke 13, 31 through 35 is for all intents and purposes, except for those last couple of verses which parallel that, that part of Matthew, that's not found anywhere else. Where it's saying that the Pharisees and the scribes came and said, get out of here, he's in Jerusalem, for Herod will kill you. Now, Remember, it does say in another gospel, which may, may have gone over. Actually, in fact, I hadn't, I hadn't put this in yet, but I'm just going to check real quick. Interesting. It is, it's in Luke uh, 23, 7 and 8. So starting in Luke 23, 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether or not the man were 
Galilean. And as soon as he knew that, he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction. What? Galilee? He sent him to Herod, who himself was at the time in Jerusalem. So it's saying that Pilate knew, oh, he was in Herod's jurisdiction. Oh, that's Galilee. Galilee is Herod's jurisdiction. Jerusalem isn't Herod's jurisdiction. Well, that's strange, because in Luke 13, 31, it says that the Pharisees came to him and said, Get out. Where is he? We know he's in Jerusalem. The Pharisees came to him and said, Get out and depart, for Herod will kill you. Well, how? Because if that wasn't Herod's jurisdiction, he would have no power to kill him in Pilate or anyone else's jurisdiction. Just because Herod may have been in Jerusalem, that did not mean he had the power to go and kill somebody. Get it? And we heard earlier in Luke, in a parallel passage concerning John the Baptist, that Herod was interested in talking to him, not in killing him. We see that in other accounts, too. We see that it's probably in Luke, and I think it's in John. Just those two, where he's sent to Herod, and Herod wanted to question him because he wanted to talk to him, right? And he didn't speak to him. Remember that? Well, these things aren't adding up, as usual. So Luke chapter 14 just continues the craziness. Um, I actually did not take a lot of notes on 14 because it was so obviously nutty and out of place that all I wrote in was uh, I wrote Luke chapter 14 is again a lot of cut and paste from Matthew it's out of order typically and not with the same dialogue in many instances that's very true um, just to go through let, let's just say the the broad strokes categories okay Luke chapter 14 has him going from this uh, <laughs> This really out of order, um, I can't even say continuity, the craziness of Luke 13, as far as ideas, right into 14, that it says that it came to pass when he was, a, he went into a house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, and they watched him, and behold, there was a certain man which had a, the dropsy. <laughs> And he said to the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, this is a question about healing on the Sabbath, right? Well, um, it's not that way in Matthew. In Matthew, if this were parallel, it would be taking place in Matthew 12. And the interesting thing about Matthew 12 is, see, Matthew 12 starts out with him and his disciples walking through a field and picking grains of the gleanings, which in the law, it was commanded that these certain gleanings you would leave for the poor, so they could walk through and glean from them. Okay, that's what they were doing. The issue was because they were doing it on the Sabbath, and they weren't breaking the Sabbath. Anybody who teaches, well, Jesus broke the Sabbath to make a point. They're, they're ignorant. They're not paying attention. When they say, you're breaking the Sabbath, in whatever you did. He did not disrespect the Sabbath. There's only one gospel that actually says in the gospel that such and such, the Pharisees wanted to kill him or the Jews wanted to kill him because he broke the Sabbath, and that's John. John's the only one that actually accuses him of breaking the Sabbath. In Matthew, he clarifies what's going on on the Sabbath in the order of importance of things that you may and may not do on the Sabbath. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, he does clarify, and he gives an example of the fact that the Levites, the priests, the sons of Aaron, work in the, who are uh, lowlifes, according to him in Luke's account. Um, but anyways, he, he does make it clear in Matthew 12 that there is an order of importance because these people work in the B.T. Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, on the Sabbath, and they're guiltless. And then it goes forward and it says he departed from there into not a house of the Pharisees, it went into a synagogue. And it says there is a man with a withered hand, not the dropsy, 
but we know this is the parallel account. And it's, fo it's following a logical progression of events because they just had a confrontation with them concerning them gleaning on the Sabbath just because they were hungry. And he clarified with them concerning the Sabbath. The difference between the laws that they were establishing, which were based on their traditions, their beliefs, and what was actually in the law, what the law actually said, and its purpose and its point. Then we have a logical progression of events in Matthew 12. There is this logical progression of events all the way down. All the way down in Matthew 12, this whole chapter logical progression of events. But in Luke, we have something quite different, and it isn't part of that logical progression of events, so it's completely pulled out of order. And it's very possible that if I went through that and just looked at the wording, uh, we could find differences in the wording. You see, it's not, it's not the parallels, and that's part of the problem, is that our irresponsible teachers they only focus on what seems to be parallels between these but it's not the parallels that get you it's not the parallels that are going to trip you up it is the areas in individual gospels that are different that are in many cases teaching something that may go against the law and the prophets or the things that we learn in the overwhelming bulk majority of the Bible. It's departures that we have to watch out for because those are the points where we're doing damage. And as I've, I've stated to you before, imagine that there's, you know, a population of Israelites or just anyone, and they don't have any specific gospel, and somebody takes the original gospel account as it was written in the first place, let's say by Matthew, let's just for sake of argument or anyone else they take the original account they change it and then they introduce that into this population and that's the only uh, that's the only account that they have let's say Luke was the only account that they have then they they're going to start getting this idea from Luke for instance that the Samaritans were a lot better people and not so bad and that it was more about your confession than Yahweh making promises to the literal genetic blood descendants of Jacob Israel, you would get a completely different um, belief system, uh, and you would build a an entirely different system of belief and doctrine or dogma, way of acting and thinking, from the one gospel. Um, it may... It may be that a number of, I guess if we have to include denominations in this, let's just say even a number of individuals, have actually built a pretty good system of believing and thus acting in spite of the four Gospels, and instead of saying that they have built a good one because of the four Gospels. Then there's the parable of the wedding feast in Luke 14, uh, 7 on. And here is another account that is not to be found. And it, it does not, it, it's not a logical progression of thought from, from the one to the other. Okay. Um, here it's saying that he's in the house of a Pharisee and, and now he's putting forth these parables. This first parable from Luke 14, 8 through 11 is, is not to be found elsewhere. Um, also, the, um, the parable of the great banquet. So we're seeing a lot of verses that are being lifted from various accounts in Matthew. Different times he might have been, say, at the house of a lawyer eating, and he said certain things, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, what's interesting is then in Luke 14, 16, he starts blending a, a parable that uh, you show told towards the end in Matthew 22, where he's talking about a great king which had, was making a marriage feast for his son. This does not say it in Luke 14. It doesn't. 
he's drawing a, an allusion through this parable in Matthew. But in Luke, it, it's just continuing this train of thought like um, that you should be good to people who are less fortunate than you. It, it's completely changing the whole idea of the body of this parable. And, and Luke does change the whole idea of the body of this parable because it's not the, the king who is making a, a feast as a marriage feast for his son. It's just like you should do good to other people. Um, in fact, like right before that, it's saying that, um, he's saying that if you, if you make any feast, when, Luke 14, 12, when you make a dinner or a supper, call not your friends, <laughs> nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen. Say, you should not call your kinsmen, your friends, your brethren, even though the law specifically requires us to be good to our kinsmen above all. The law specifically tells us to be good to our kinsmen above all. Nor your rich neighbors, sure, lest they also bid thee again and recompense be made to thee. Yeah, I mean, God forbid you be good to your kinsmen and your neighbors and they be good back to you. That wouldn't be good because that wouldn't be Lukean. But when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now, I can completely, I'm f good with that. Yeah, be good to those who are less fortunate. I'm, I'm, I'm not okay with that. I'm absolutely good with that. And in fact, there are many provisions in the law of how we are to be good to those who are less fortunate than us. So there's no problem in that whatsoever. Remember, it's not the good things that you want to watch out for. Okay? If you have somebody, I don't care if they're supposedly a biblical author or if they're just somebody who they call a church father or whatever else, and they have all of these lofty platitudes about being good and so on and so forth and being charitable and righteous and decent, especially to those who are less fortunate than you, that's all fine and good, and that's not necessarily the problem. That's not necessarily the problem. So him saying to be good to the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, that's not the problem. Okay, the problem is right before that when he's saying, and you have a feast or a supper, he says, don't call your friends, your brethren, your kinsmen. And I think, call me crazy, that that again, since it's only found in Luke, could be the furthering of an agenda that we see. It started already with the whole idea of replacing the kinsmen with the Samaritan who we knew were problematic for those left amongst the children of Jacob from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And actually, even before that, they were problematic. And we see him introducing them and the idea of a confession as being more important than blood. Now, your blood does not necessarily mean that you're just a fantastic person, but that's not the point. Some people get that wrong, but your blood does mean that you are part of a covenant that was established at a certain place and time with a certain people, all the children of a certain man or men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it does mean that you are part of that covenant if you have that blood, if you are part of that line of people. And so you do have certain responsibilities for one thing, a certain place which you are to occupy in the world, another thing. You will also have a lot more suffering than other people who don't keep these covenants, which Israel has suffered. And that's the other reason why you can know that the Jews are not Israel. So what I have a problem with is the departures, not the parallels. The parallels are all fine and good. I have a problem with the departures, either when we find sections that are entirely not found anywhere else, or again, which, like I said, would take an enormous amount of time, when we do have passages that seem to be parallels, but the thing is they have so, um, they have so much difference in wording that oftentimes it is saying something different. It may be subtly saying something that's different, but it is without a doubt saying something that is different. Um, 
And then, of course, the cost of discipleship. And we have parallels that are um, jumping back. So some of these parallels are jumping far forward. Some are jumping far back. And just to end it off with the difference that I did point out when we were going through what was supposed to be the Sermon on the Mount, we get to this Luke 14, 34, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? That's from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, and it does follow a logical course of events and thought reasoning in Matthew, but here it's just crammed in willy-nilly just like everything else in Luke. And Luke does fail to mention when he says in 1435, it's neither fit for the land or for the dunghill, which, I mean, if he's talking about the actual soil, yeah, you, you wouldn't salt your earth and you probably wouldn't put it in the dunghill if that's, you know, your manure for the earth. I thought that was kind of obvious. And then he says, but men cast it out. Well, not exactly. You see, according to Matthew, he said it's good for nothing else but to be cast on the ground and trampled on by men. And we know why salt is cast on the ground and trampled on by men. It's cast on the ground to melt ice. And with that, I'll see you next time.